Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 15 this morning in our studies on Israel's greatest hits. We're going through the book of Psalms, the 13 week studies on the variety of different Psalms that exist in this uh, a book. And so this morning we have a different one altogether and uh, let's, we'll be studying that together in Psalm chapter 15. So Lord, we invite you to come. We invite you to speak to us. We invite you to challenge us through your word this morning. And we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Do we have anybody here who likes to camp? Any, any campers here? Any people who like to go in the mountains and camp? We got a few, yeah. I, I got to tell you, I have a little bit of mixed feelings about camping. I, if it's just me in my own tent or me and my wife in my own tent, I, I enjoy camping. However, I have spent too many years in my life working with youth and men doing construction projects, mission projects, in filthy places, and we wind up camping. And I don't know if you've ever camped with people who have not showered all day long, who don't have access to bathing, and you put several of those people in a small confined area of a tent, and you pull that tent open, and you walk open, and you go, whoa, it's something that is not all that pleasant for me. In fact, well, I remember when I was a youth pastor many years ago, we did a work project down in Mexico, and we had been working all day, sun up, sun down, in the hot sun, and uh, didn't have access to showers. And we all, uh, I think there was about seven or eight of us, we all shared the same tent. And uh, that evening, I, I, we, well, we were getting in the car, heading back to our campsite, and, and I realized I had a problem. I was with youth, and I thought none of these people brought anything to make themselves smell any better. These people don't know about deodorant, or they don't know about, uh, you, you know, breath mints, or uh, anything. I mean, there was a, you know, you open the door in the van, I'm sure the flies were dying. That's how, how bad it was. I was like, G guys, really, this is, this is horrible. And so I'm thinking in my mind as we're heading to the campsite, all these guys are going to be in my tent, and they haven't even taken their shoes off yet. <laughs> and I feared for my life. <laughs> With, and so I made, a, uh, I made it appealing to them. I said, hey, have you guys ever slept out on the beach <laughs> without a tent at all? Have you ever done that? And I said, no, we've never done that. It's so much fun. <laughs> and I convinced them all to sleep out on the beach for the rest of the trip. And I had the tent all to myself. You, now, now, before you judge me <laughs> and say, wow, what a youth pastor you were and become hypercritical. Number one, it's this reason that many of you don't like camping. And then secondly, think about who you would invite into your home. Right? Or think about even if I were to come to your home and, and you were to ask me to come to your home and invite me to dinner and I come after I've played tennis for two hours and I, I don't shower, I have a soaking wet t-shirt, all of my clothes are soaking wet and I walk in and I, here I am just soaking wet from sweat and I say, where's dinner? You'd look at me and go, that's a little bit rude. You probably need to clean up a little bit if you're going to come into my house and you're going to eat dinner at my table. Right? And, and even beyond that, think of this. Now, suppose, you know, we uh, decide uh, I, I, I'm doing ministry and I find an axe murderer here in Manila. And I say, hey, you know what? I know these people at Union Church. They're good people and I, you don't have a place to live. Why don't you go live with them? And I invite them to your house. You would say, wait a second. We'll take in lots of people. But axe murderers are a little bit over the line. Right? We have parameters, or if I brought a terrorist, or a lot of other uh, different type of people, if I invited them to stay at your house, you would say, wait a second, Pastor. There are certain people that we allow into our house, and there are certain people that we really aren't comfortable staying in our house. Well, that really brings us to Psalm chapter 15, where David is going to ask a question. Who may dwell in his holy hill, or who may dwell in his holy house. But before we get to that, this Psalm chapter 15 is what we call a wisdom psalm. Now, if you look at your handout that I gave you, this is the backside, the same as you had last week. It's the different types of psalms that exist in the book of Psalms. The first week, we looked at the uh, idea of a Torah psalm, or that which was highlighting the word of God. The second week, after the Torah psalm, last week we looked at a psalm of lament, and this week, we are looking at a wisdom psalm. And really what a wisdom psalm is, is a wisdom psalm provides godly guidelines and instructions as to how people should live in this world. 
It gives us certain things that we should be doing in order to live under the design that God has for us, to get the most out of this life that God has made for us. And certainly, this psalm will be full of instruction. In fact, we are going to spend a great deal of time on very specific instruction. But look how David begins this psalm. It says this. He says in verse 1, he says, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent and who may live on your holy mountain? Now, we have this, he starts off with this question. Who can share a tent with the Lord? Right? You think of the Lord's holiness, you think of his pristine nature. Who of us is able to go in there and say, I will not defile this tent? Right? It's the question that he asks. Now, the imagery that he pulls out when he says tent automatically goes back to the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, also known in Hebrew, is basically a dwelling place or the residing place. But it was seen as the residing place of God, where God dwelled among the people. And long before the tabernacle was a permanent temple in Jerusalem, Solomon builds a temple for the house of the Lord. Long before that, it was a tent that went with the people everywhere. It sojourned with them. And even David, when he writes this, still the, the temple hadn't been established. He would look out his palace and see right across the street, you know, at the Holy Mount. He would see this, this tabernacle or this tent. And so he brings this imagery to mind. Who can actually go in there where God resides? And, and if you look at the Old Testament prescription as to who could go in there, there was a high priest and there were certain requirements for purity before you could go in there. There would be ceremonial cleansing. There would be a a, a purification rite before you could go into this holy area of God. Why? Because God was holy. He is altogether different. He is altogether perfect. He is altogether pure and without flaw. And throughout the Old Testament law, there were many remembrances are reminders that God was holy. Even if you look at the Old Testament law, I'm going to get a little bit in the Old Testament law, and I know some people will start glazing over, you know, this is kind of uh, a little tedious. But there is what was called the law. There are 613 laws in the Old Testament. And many of those were devoted to understanding God's holiness. Some people have labeled them the ceremonial laws. And they were laws like this. Suppose you grew mold on your wall in your house. You were to say, identify that and say that was unclean. And you were to do something about that. Now, now why? Why does the Bible, why is it worried? You know, of all the things in the world, why is the Bible concerned about a little mold on the wall? The indication was this, that on the backdrop of a clean wall, there was a spot And there was a stain. That was the reminder of God's holiness and man's fallenness. That we are imperfect and God is perfect. And so even if I got a rash on my skin, they would say that's unclean. Because when you look down, you would see there was a blot on that which was pure. It was to be a reminder of God's holiness. Even the law said you couldn't mix fabrics. I couldn't have a cotton and polyester shirt mixed together. Why? Because that was the mixture of holiness and unholiness. It was a symbol. And and what the Israelite law did was create this imagery everywhere in your life, where you're eating, when you're living in your house, when you're wearing clothes, when you're looking at your own body. They were given these reminders constantly that God is holy. It was important for the people of Israel to remember, God wanted them to remember that God lives in a holy tent, that he is perfect in every way. And so even in the book of Leviticus, where all these uh, laws are given, it says, be holy as I am holy multiple times. God will give a law and he'll say, be holy as I am holy. Be holy as I am holy. God was trying to uh, convey the the holiness of himself. Now, look at what David said. He clarifies then who can go into this holy tent. It says in verse 2 of chapter 15, he says, the one whose walk is blameless and who does what is righteous. Because God is blameless and God is righteous. Now, this is one of those texts. If you have been here for a long time, you know this is where I like to respond. We, we like to insert our names into certain texts around here. 
Now, look at this. Uh, I will insert my name first and see how it sounds. And then you follow, okay? Chad's walk is blameless. Insert your own name. Chad does what is righteous. Feels a little weird, huh? <laughs> because it's not always true. It's not always true in every circumstance. As I look at my walk, it, it, it's one of those things as I look at scripture and I say, Lord, I, I, can I go to your holy tent? And David says, no, oh, only those whose walk is righteous and walk is blameless can go. And I go, wait a second, Chad's walk is righteous, but I, I know me. And even to complicate the matters further, I go to Titus chapter 1, verse 6, and it talks about the qualifications of an elder and a pastor. You know what the first qualification is? It says this, an elder must be blameless. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> I, I think, you know, since I've been at UCM, I'd like to say I haven't lost my temper at all. I'd like to say that I haven't coveted a few motorcycles I've seen around. I, I, I'd like to say that I, I wasn't gluttonous. That certainly went out the, uh, you know, out the door at Christmas time. I'd like to say I wasn't selfish. I'd like to say that I was blameless. But we all know that that is not true. So the question then is, can I go to God's holy hill? Can I be the pastor or should I just resign today and say, hey, I'm not qualified and then we look at each other and we start looking at one another and we say, who is qualified then? And there's really nobody here who is qualified. So what is David teaching here when he says, my walk is blameless? Number one, I don't think he's talking about possessing a perfect lifestyle. And, and secondly, I don't think that he's talking about, some people might say, well, you know, when we come to Jesus Christ, we are made blameless. We are made spotless. You know, 2 Corinthians talks about we become the aroma of Christ to God, which means now we are sweet smelling because we are made perfect. Or you think of Romans chapter 4, verse 22, where it says, once you have faith in Christ, righteousness is credited to your account. Or, or you become full of righteousness, and you are without sin. So you're blameless. I don't really think that that is what David is talking about here. I think what David is talking about here is the fact of the walk that is righteous. That because we have our people after God's own heart, because we have righteousness inside of us, because we long for God, there will be righteousness that is coming outside of us. Do you get the picture there? Even Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12. He says, he's talking about our righteousness being righteous, made righteous in Christ. And everyone here, if you are following Jesus Christ, let me just tell you, you are righteous. You are blameless. Positionally, God sees you as righteous and sees you as blameless. But then Paul says in Romans chapter 12, he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He says this, because God has made you righteous, now live righteously. Live holy lives. Let that outworking of his righteousness come out in the things that you do. And I think that that is what David is saying here. He says, the one whose walk is blameless. And, and, and it's like this. I used to have a, my, my dad, um, when I was a little boy, he won a, this giant stuffed animal at the fair, you know? And I love that thing. His name was Magic. I still remember him. A big old bear. And old Magic, you know, as a kid, we would jump on him and pound him and grab him. And, and, and Magic, o over time, he began to have these little foam balls coming out of him. You know, it's his insides coming out. And I think that's what the Bible is teaching us. We know what is inside. I could look at those foam balls coming out everywhere that I took magic around. I would drag him around and there would be a trail of foam balls, right? I think that's what the Bible is saying. We will understand what is inside of us by that which is falling out of us, which is leaking out of us. And, and that's what David is identifying. It's your walk. Your walk should match with what is going on inside of your life. And I grow, I guess, a little bit worried when I see people who are indifferent to striving in the body of Christ to live blameless lives. It worries me because it takes that righteousness that is inside not very seriously. It's not really the outworking of that. If you are not striving for blamelessness, 
it, it, be careful, beloved, because our righteousness inside is always transferred to our walk outside. It, it should be always working its way to the surface. In fact, John says it this way in 1 John 3.10. He says, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Listen. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Now, I don't know if those startle you, but that is a very serious warning to the world and to the church. And, and I believe that we would be a poor ministry if we didn't share this concept with you. That, that, that there should be this righteousness working out uh, of us from our inside out. Don't think as many places do in our world today, that holiness doesn't matter. If you are not concerned about holiness, John would say, you better check your heart. Better, better check your insides. You better check your walk. If, if you've gained the righteousness of Christ, then there should be a lot of it leaking out of you. I, I like what Eugene Peterson wrote. He said this. He said, in our culture, kind of culture, anything, even news about God, can be sold if it's packaged freshly. But when it loses its novelty, it goes into the garbage heap. There is a great market for religious experience in our world, but there is little enthusiasm for the patient acquisition of virtue. There is little inclination to sign up for a long apprenticeship in what earlier generations called holiness. Do you understand that? So many people in our world today, when it comes to religious experience, they're looking for a new religious experience. They're looking for something new in church, something to move them, something to, to, to shake them, something to, to, to tantalize their senses, and, and, and that's all fine. But oftentimes we throw this desire of holiness on the heap of ashes and we become less concerned about that. I, I can tell you that over and over in my life in ministry. I've seen so many people concerned about so many other things in church. We talk about other things. We get excited about other things. We long for other things. But where in the body of Christ are those who are longing for this apprenticeship in holiness to become more and more conformed to the Lord himself? I want to ask you, do you have this longing for holiness in your life? Do you have an apprenticeship in holiness? I, I would encourage you this, as Paul encouraged the church of Rome. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Strive for his holiness. That's the wisdom in the wisdom psalm here. The general instruction here given is that we should be longing for holiness. I put number one on your outline. If I want to dwell in the holy hill, I need to value holiness. I need to value holiness in my life. I love what David Brainerd wrote. He, he was a missionary to the American Indians in the 1700s in his journal. I would encourage you, if you ever get a chance to get a hold of his journal, to read that journal. He says this. He says, oh, I feel it's heaven to please him, to be just what he would have me to be, that my soul were holy as he is holy. Oh, that it were pure, even as Christ is pure, as my Father in heaven is perfect. These, I feel, are the sweetest commands in God's book, comprising all others. And shall I break them? Must I break them? Oh, that I could concentrate myself, soul and body, for his service forever. Oh, that I could give myself to him, so as never more attempt to be my own. Oh, Lord, make me holy. Make me like you. This is the person I think that David is describing here, the blameless person who is longing for the holiness of God in their lives. But now, notice, David is going to turn to some very specific traits of what that holiness looks like. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. I'm not a big fan of teaching or preaching through lists, and this is what we have in the rest of the text, are very specific things. And, and if we were to look at each of these individually, we would here, be here for several weeks. But we want to put them into several categories. And the first category is this. We can identify our blamelessness through how we use our words with others. Look at what it says in verse 2. It says, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous. Now, look at what it says. Who speaks the truth from their heart, 
whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor, and casts no slurs on others. Okay, this person strives to promote others and to build others up, primarily how they use their mouths. In the way that they use their mouths, they are not using them to tear people down, and they are using them to build people up. So let's do this together. Chad speaks the truth from his heart. Chad's tongue utters no slander. Chad does no wrong to a neighbor. Chad casts no slur on others. It's kind of progressively getting quieter and quieter. I don't know why that is. But the idea here is when you start looking and and you start speaking those words, is that real in your life? The Bible teaches quite often how we ought to regard others through our speech. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 verse 29. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. See, the blameless tongue The righteous tongue is given for building each other up. Now, survey your language over this last week. Okay? Now, maybe you remember what you talked about. Maybe you don't remember. But maybe at this moment you are a bit convicted because you know that you used your tongue quite slanderously. Or you didn't use your tongue to build up. Do you you realize God gave you this mouth to praise him and build others up? Now, what are you using yours for? See, the righteous individual or the blameless individual is constantly assessing how they're using their mouth to edify the church and edify God's people and build the Lord up. And I think in our world today, we are losing much of this. Certainly in my home country, it has gone crazy through social media, is bombarding us with uh, tabloids uh, and tabloids with salacious details. Politicians are constantly verbally lambasting many people. And we have a culture right now in much of our world that is embracing verbal assaulting. We have a culture that is embracing sort of blasting other people, whether it's behind a computer screen or whether it's face to face. And we sort of, sort of carefully manufacture slander in our world today. Brothers, sisters, beloved, the blameless individual, according to this text, says, No, I use my words not to slander, but I use my words to build people up in Christ. And if there is righteousness inside, it should be coming outside in the way that we speak. James puts it this way when he talks about taming the tongue. He says, with the tongue we praise our Lord, our Father. And with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. You get that? You got two things going on. You've got what it's used for, and then you have what it's not supposed to be designed for. It says, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this can't be. Can both fresh water and salt water come from the same spring? The the illustration is simple, right? Out of this cup, if I were to pour this out, what do you expect to come out? What color? Brown. Because that's what's inside. That's what's in the spring, But this one, if I pour it out, what do you expect? You expect white to come out because that's what's in the spring. What James says is what is coming out of your mouth is an identifying factor of what's in the spring. Now, what color is your spring? (laughs) How clean is your spring by the language that you are using? I think of David himself. You know, David, a man after God's own heart, he, he wouldn't criticize Saul. Remember Saul? He's pursuing him for years unjustly in the desert. David has a chance to kill him in a cave. David goes there, or Saul goes in to relieve himself and David's in the cave that he's in. And his men come to David and say, David, the Lord has provided this opportunity. You got him. Take your sword and whack away. Done. You become king, problem solved. This evil person is taken care of. 
And David says, no, I can't do that. And, and what I love is what David says to Saul after he, he reveals to Saul that he was in the cave. It says, uh, Saul is looking, or David's looking down on Saul. It says, then David went out of the cave and he called out to Saul. He called out, you maggot infested pile of pond scum. Did he say that? <laughs> He didn't say that. I would have some choice words for Saul at this point. I could be very creative with my language as to what I could call Saul at that moment. But what has David said? He says, my Lord, the king. He honors. He doesn't slander. That is the, the blameless life that I think David is describing here. I put number two. Jot it down on your outline. I need to closely monitor how I verbally treat others. How I verbally treat others. Do I use my mouth in such a way that it indicates that I am having a blameless walk? Now we look at another category that David identifies of the blameless walk. Notice how he seemingly goes in the opposite direction. Look at verse 4. It says, Who despises a vile person, but honors those who fear the Lord. Okay, here we go. Chad despises a vile person. That's a little uncomfortable, I know, right? That just doesn't roll well off of us as believers' mouths. Chad honors those who fear the Lord. Okay. Doesn't it seem like we're going, the pendulum is swinging the other way? We just said, don't talk badly about people. Don't slander people. And then David says, now... I would love for you to vile some unrighteous people, you know, or despise some vile people. The unrighteous people around, you, you despise them. And so naturally, that seems to conflict. If we despise them, we ought to say horrible things about them, right? That, do you see the tension that exists there? And so what is David talking about when he says we must vile or we must despise vile people? And then at the same time say that we have to not slander people. I think it is this. Dr. Corey Berry, the president of Biola University, says that we need to have a firm center with soft edges. A firm center with soft edges. What do I mean by that? A firm center means that we recognize that there is evil in the world. Now, in some places, that sort of recognition that there is evil in the world is sort of going away in the body of Christ. But, but we recognize that there are certain things that displease God because they are destructive and they are outside of God's design. So we despise that which God despises. In fact, if you look in the Bible for the terms uh, defined of sin, here are some terms. Broken, stain, debt, leprosy, blemish, missing the mark. Wondering, crooked, rebelling, slave master, trespassing, injustice, evil, desolation, uh, drunken, toil, impiety, vomit, lawlessness. Does it sound like sin is something that we should embrace? Does it, I mean, that's vile, isn't it? I mean, one of the words, vomit. Hey, would you like a good pile of vomit? No, it is disgusting. It is vile. To God, And so we don't embrace that and we stand firm on that and we don't compromise in that area. And I think in many of our world that we are beginning in, in much of the world to embrace those things that are vile to God or at least tolerate some of those things that are vile to God. But Romans 12 says it this way. It says, abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. We need to keep aiming for the biblical target of what is good and what is wrong. There is a target. It is a firm, fixed, solid target. And if we're aiming for that target, that is what is good. That is what we need to embrace. I'm reminded of the story of, um, I heard a, a, a guy was driving through the countryside and he, he was an archer, uh, he, he sh shot arrows, he was into archery and he comes through this countryside and he sees a barn and on the side of this barn, there was this big target with a bullseye. And in the middle of that, there were hundreds of arrows in the middle of the bullseye. And the guy thought, man, somebody's really good at archery. And it being somebody who was involved in archery, he had to know who could shoot all of these arrows in the middle of this bullseye. And so he pulled into the farm. And he, hello, is anybody around? And some guy comes walking out and he says, hi, how are you? 
I, well, I, I'm great. I'm just admiring this bullseye. I, I have to know who can shoot that accurately. The man said, oh, no, you don't understand. That was done by the village idiot. He put all the arrows in there and then circled the, drew the target around them. And I think that's what we are doing so much in our culture today. We're, we're, we're shooting our arrows and where they land, we like where they land, and then we say, oh, that's the target. That's what God wants from me. No, that's not. See, a lot of that is vile. What God wants from you is clearly defined in Scripture. There is a right, there is a wrong, and there is a target that we are aiming for. We don't just say, I'm doing this, and this is the target. That is vile to the Lord. There is a target. And we don't compromise. That's that firm center that we have. Godliness in an ungodly world. But with that being said, soft edges. How do we then say this is wrong and still speak well of others? That's the trick, isn't it? See, here's the other side of this. Is I've seen too many times in social media and even from my own friends on Facebook, is when we see vileness, we lash out verbally in ways that are unpleasing to God. We lash out in slanderous ways that attack people. See, here's the trick. You despise what is vile while still speaking well of your neighbor. See, oftentimes we compromise one or the other and I think the, the message here that, that David is saying is that we can still stand firm on godly principles without compromising our blamelessness verbally. That's a challenge in much of the world as I see the church that sometimes has gotten backed into a corner and has lashed out by its own message or even by politicians that speak vicariously through it. We need to be careful of our verbal assaults, even in the midst of this, this world that has many things that's wrong with it. Our, our words need to be kind and loving, even when we see wickedness around us. I put number three on your outline. Jot it down. I need to strive to maintain a firm center and soft edges. A firm center and soft edges. Beloved, the blameless person, I believe, strives to maintain both firmly rejecting evil, aiming their arrows at a fixed moral truth while maintaining verbal integrity. Look at our last category here. It says in verse four, it says, who even, or keeps an oath even when it hurts. Let's say it together as we go. Chad keeps an oath even when it hurts. And does not change their mind. Chad does not change his mind. Who lends money to the poor without interest? Chad lends money to the poor without interest. And who does not accept a bribe against the innocent? Chad does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Okay. So here, David is dealing with issues of injustice. We've talked about holiness. We've talked about a moral target. Now he is identifying areas of injustice in this world and becoming people of integrity in a world full of injustice. And the first area is in our business practice, in our business negotiations. Notice what he says. He says, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change their mind. But basically, they are honest and trustworthy in their negotiations. The book of Proverbs puts it this way, Proverbs 11.1. 1, the Lord detests dishonest scales. It's vile to him. But accurate weights find favor with him. Now, what does that mean? It means that you are a person of integrity in your business. That when you are selling something, you are selling what you are really selling. <laughs> that you are not inflating the price. That you are not taking advantage of people. I used to live in Mexico and we would take these, I don't know if this happens here in the Philippines, but we would take these five liter, uh, I don't know the word in English, but containers of, um, uh, for gas. And we'd go down to the gas station and I would say, it would be empty and I would say, five liters please. And the, and the, the gas Station numbers would read five liters, and I would look down, and there'd be about three and a half in there. 
And that was normal. That was just the practice. That the gas stations were always cheating people of what they said they were giving. Understand, <laughs> that is vile. That is wrong. That is not appropriate. That is not what the Bible says is just in our integrity and dealing with our, our, our business uh, in our business dealings with other people. And think of David. I'm sure he had seen many used camel salesmen. You know, <laughs> do we in the Philippines? Do we have a problem with used car salesmen here? Yeah, in the States, there's always the joke, the corruption of the used car salesman. Well, I think of the used camel salesman, you know? The guy coming out with David, hey, she's a beaut. This camel's falling apart. Yeah, she's got, you know, a thousand more kilometers on her. She can go 50 kilometers on a, a, on a drink of water. And we know that the thing is falling apart. We know that the hump is lilting. We know that the tread is falling off the hooves. And, and yet we, we sell that, saying it's good when it's not. That is a lack of integrity, and it is that which is unrighteous. It is that which takes our blamelessness away. But then notice here, it says integrity in dealing with the poor. It, it says, who lends money to the poor without interest and does not accept a bribe against the innocent. It says, don't take advantage of the poor or those that are work in a disadvantaged place. Listen, in the Old Testament, let me give you the illustration of a man who was known as a righteous man. His name was Boaz. Anybody heard of Boaz? Ruth and Boaz. He was known for being righteous. You know one of the reasons why he was righteous? Was because he was a sloppy farmer. Say, so what, what do you mean he was a sloppy farmer? See, the righteous man was the one who, when they gathered their harvest, they would throw some of the stuff off the edges. They would let it fall to the ground, and the poor could come and collect it. That is righteousness. Are you sloppy businessmen and sloppy businesswomen and sloppy household earners to let your excess overflow to the poor instead of taking advantage of the poor? This is part of the wisdom psalm that is given here. And by the way, just parenthetically, here comes the, the, the professor out of me. In nations where integrity is high, where concern for the poor is high, do you realize that those nations are some of the most prosperous nations in the world? I, I have some statistics that I did, used to teach when I was teaching worldviews class. I know this is small, but if you look at the top 10 democratic economic nations of the world and the least corrupt nations of the world, there, there are eight that cross over. Those that are the most, uh, least corrupt are the most prosperous. Isn't that an interesting thought to you? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that God exalts the righteous nation. Even here in Psalms, the last Psalm, Psalm 15, 5 said, whoever does these things, who lives blamelessly, who is full of integrity, who is righteous, will not be shaken. That's God's design. By the way, I love when research backs up what the Bible teaches. God exalts the righteous and humbles the proud. I put number four, last thing on your outline. I need to recognize the great value of integrity. I need to recognize the great value of integrity. Lord, who may dwell in your holy tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? Someone who is serious about embracing God's standards of holiness while living in this unholy world. You know, when I was a kid, one, one last story real quick. We were doing some construction in our neighborhood and there was this pile of mud next to my house. And, uh, you know, what does a little boy do when he sees a pile of mud? I have a little boy. I know what my little boy would do, right? And I just do dove in. And then kids were coming home from school. I was coming after school, and they were walking down the street. And I, was, I was, went completely under this mud. And then they would walk by, and I would jump up and go, mud monster! And I would go, and I'd try and attack them and hug them and get them all muddy. Well, apparently, the neighbor's parents didn't like this, so they called my mom and said, do you know what your son is doing? In horror, she comes running out the front door. Looking at me, she says, Chad, what are you doing? Get out of the mud. I remember these words. We are Williamses, and Williamses don't play in the mud. We don't let mud into our house. 
get out of the mud. And then she did this very thing. Most embarrassing thing that happened to me is my, I'm still traumatic. Uh, uh, I still got uh, emotional uh, baggage from it. She stripped me down to my whitey tidies <laughs> out in the front yard in front of everyone and took the hose and started hosing me down. <laughs> you will not go into my house until you are clean. Listen, who may go into the Lord's holy house? You are Christians. You are followers of Christ. You are blameless inside. You are righteous. Oh, that we would be clean. Oh, that we would live pure lives. Listen here, we start our purity through Christ. And if you're here and your life is full of impurities, let me tell you, Christ will wipe all of those away. And as he does that, you start to be transformed, to live the righteous life that he has done inside of you. Oh, to be holy. Lord, make us a holy people, a holy nation, consecrated unto you, that we may dwell in your house, that we may walk a blameless walk. And we ask this in your name. Amen.